Hello everybody and welcome to another video. Today we're going to be talking about more feature pack news. I've got a lot of videos I'm juggling right now, so prepare for a lot to come out on the channel. As you guys may know, it is the second anniversary of Guild Wars 2 for Head Start characters right now. I still have plans with that and we are still doing Living World Speculation, so bear that in mind. But there's been so much news coming out, we've got to keep on top of it. Uh, I'm here today to talk to you guys about the final stuff announced for competitive week of the feature pack. We are just now moving into the second week of news named fresh start which I'm sure will have a lot more interesting things but we'll talk about that and some stuff that's going on in the community too um, for basically the continuation of arena nets terrible month of PR so let's start number one there has been the announcement that two devs are leaving the company naturally owing to the timing of this with regard to the other stuff going on in the community right now about how arena Net can't communicate and so forth People are speculating and gossiping. I've done a little of that, but really I don't want to be in the business of that. So I'm not going to talk about it too much. Basically, two devs have left. Kate Welch, who is the host and a fantastic host, might I add, or was a fantastic host for the uh, live stream points of interest. She will be leaving. Primarily, I believe she was mostly a UI designer on the back end for stuff with ArenaNet. And also the head of community management there too, Martin Kirstein, who's worked there for eight years, was very active and prominent around Guild Wars 2's launch, did a lot of stuff to do with conventions became one of these faces one of these names many people recognize he has also left the company and I'm gonna leave it there I think that's probably the most professional thing I can do and if you want to look more into it please be my guest but I question the value of further discussion um, and so the other thing that uh, people have been pretty negative about too was another interview that came out of Gamescom in which the devs fully announce uh, something that I think anyone who's been following Guild Wars 2 you should have known this okay that they're not really working on dungeons at the moment they don't have any plans for dungeons. They just straight out said, look, yeah, dungeons, we're not adding hard mode to them. We're not really doing anything. We tested a little bit with Aether Path. We felt it was too much effort, and so we're stepping back from them, okay? I think that's a reasonable thing for them to say. Any true change to dungeons would have to have some serious thought and consideration go into it. I am not joking or exaggerating when I say that I could definitely write, like, a 50-page manifesto about how I personally would change dungeons, and it's not something I think ArenaNet can do flippantly. So they're not looking into it. The dungeon community has been fobbed off for a long time. There are some people saying, you know, that's it for me. I'm going to quit the game. Dungeons is all I really want. And I do think it's a pretty much a disgrace that Guild Wars 2 has no difficult five-man content, but that's not what they're prioritizing on. And to me, this isn't really news. I guess that's what I'm saying. I've accepted that fate a long time ago and try to enjoy what's there in the game right now. For some people, they're just now coming to appreciate this. They needed the devs to say it out loud. And that's certainly quite disappointing. But no dungeon changes, and that makes me um, think that we're probably not going to get any announcements either for upcoming feature pack changes on the topic too. To put a slightly more positive spin on the events of last week, there is currently a lot going on on the official forums, and not bad stuff necessarily. Yes, I know, the official forums, they're a hive of toxicity and bad discussion, but the devs really are jumping in, they're wading through a lot of people, being very open to communication, and uh, another CDI, I believe, has already begun. They're talking about uh, reformatting the way that these discussions work, having new stickies that have all these bullet points about the things devs are aware of and uh, much more clear roadmaps about where ArenaNet sits on different topics and what they're working on. It does look like there's a lot of positive change occurring on the forums right now. And maybe you might want to go check it out. Uh, in all seriousness, maybe you might want to go check it out. Particularly uh, Chris Whiteside, who headed off many of the previous CDIs, as far as I'm aware. And uh, Colin Johansson, too. These are two big names that have been leaving a lot of messages. But there are so many dev posts, uh, you wouldn't believe it. So let's talk about it. The feature pack, that's the main thing I'll be discussing on this video. Uh, competitive week before, we had heard about some SPVP changes. Now we're going to be getting a fair amount of stuff to do with World vs. World and the Command Attack system. So let's talk about that first of all, because there was some controversy here also. Um, before this article came out, it was understood that the new Command Attack system would work like this. They were adding more colours, nobody can complain about that. They were also making Command Attacks account bound, so for players like me who have just bought one tag like on lists when we log in after the feature pack that will now be unlocked for absolutely everyone on our account this also people didn't really complain about in exchange for the fact that they were now account bound arena net revealed that they were upping the price of commander tags to 300 gold this may have ticked some people off 
But we are in a position here where we can abuse this and say, right, we'll buy your commander tag now before feature pack, and you get it 200 gold cheaper. And in exchange for it being account bound, we can now say, look, let's say you had eight characters on your account. That would have cost you 800 gold to get one for everyone. Now it's only 300 gold. So in many regards, this was still a change in favor of the player base. They even announced that they were going to be refunding people who had bought over 300 golds worth of command tags before the patch so that you wouldn't have felt totally ripped off. There's another discussion here too about the price going up that I think a lot of people uh, don't consider, right? And this is the idea of inflation, meaning that a commander tag's value today, like how difficult it is to get 100 gold today, is nothing like it was at launch. I bought my commander tag very close to launch, and that was a serious serious undertaking. You can actually do the maths based on gem conversions if you like, and basically the cost of a commander tag at launch under today's economy is like over a thousand gold. So even if you make the argument that ArenaNet are raising the price to make it, you know, somewhat closer to what it was back at launch, it's still far cheaper than it was for those original players who spent all that effort so long ago to get their first commander tag. We're still pretty much in the green. Here's the issue though, here's where ArenaNet really dropped the ball. Um, this idea of having c different coloured commander tags really was something born out of months and months of discussion on the forums between the players and the devs about how the commander tag system could be best improved. And this included a plethora of ideas and things people wanted to see for the commander tag system. Of these ideas, the very most basic one was the idea of having different coloured commander tags. This was the easiest thing for ArenaNet to implement, and with the feature pack, this is the only thing that they are implementing. That immediately has got people a little bit ticked off. Why are there no changes to the squad system? Why do we have no squad UI coming in? Why are so many other key features that would make the system so much better, make World vs. World in particular a more fun game type to be a part of? Why are they not there? Why is it only the coloured commander tags? After so many months of discussion and potentially so many months worth of work that could have gone into the system. That's the first thing that kind of irritated people. But second, the whole idea of having coloured commander tags was so that people could have the convenience and the utility to make their tags work well. The idea of having coloured commander tags isn't so that people have some prestige to go for. The commander tags aren't supposed to be seen as extra powerful armour or new weapons that you can get that you should be able to buy for a high price and show off to your friends. And ArenaNet seemed to misunderstand this. There has always been a bit of a struggle within the community between people who like the idea of com tags as prestige and people who want them purely as utility. Honestly, the guys that sit there and say, oh, I'll never use your tag unless you're actually using it. It really winds me up to see commander tags. Commander tags shouldn't be for prestige and get really antsy about it kind of irritate me, but I can see what people are saying. These aren't supposed to be a prestige feature. And so ArenaNet's original idea of this system was that you'd have to buy every single coloured tag independently for a cost of 300 gold. This meant if you wanted the full utility that people were asking for that the patch was supposed to bring, you would have to spend over a thousand gold to get your account fully kitted out. They locked this functionality that people wanted behind a huge paywall and obviously as soon as anything like this happens, accusations get thrown around very quickly about how Arena only cares about getting our money through gems than anything else. And whether that last part is true or not, there is definite merit to the outcry about it. This wasn't supposed to be to do with prestige or giving something people in PvE do a lot, something to spend their gold on. It was supposed to help commanders in World vs. World. World vs. World, a game type where people typically don't get that much money in the first place. It was a mistake. And fortunately, because all of this that I've just described to you came out before the feature pack announcement article, ArenaNet assessed the feedback and, as some people have said, maybe for the first time ever, really very quickly listened to the players and adapted their game plan. Supposedly two people over there worked the whole weekend to change their original implementation of the system. And when this article came out in competitive week, this is what was said, and I quote, we are happy to announce that once you are a commander, you will have an access to a variety of colours. Choose from red, yellow, purple or classic blue to customise your commander icon. 
That means they are no longer locked behind a paywall. It's still gone up to 300 gold, and hopefully I've demonstrated to you guys why I personally think the 300 gold is completely reasonable, given in mind that it's now 100% account bound, given in mind that the game's economy is so different to what it was once towards launch. But the different colors themselves will just be awarded to people with a single commander's compendium. And for people like me, who bought a commander tag over a year ago now, when I log in after the feature pack, I will not only have my blue tag on every single character on my account, I will also have a purple one, a red one, and a yellow one. And that is probably the best way they could have implemented it. Personally, I'm not still 100% satisfied though. I was very much hoping when this article came out, there would be further announcements to make. Not just, oh hey, there's different colored tags and it's going to count bound. They would actually have some changes, as I said, to the squad UI system, to the kind of things that commanders can do. But there has been none of that. And I find that a little bit underwhelming. Yeah, different colors are cool, sure. But it's not that much of a game changer, especially for other areas of the game, like outside of World versus World. Really, this means so, so little. And I am a bit underwhelmed. I've got to be honest. I mean, how long until commander tags and squads and stuff actually get the quality of life that they really deserve? I mean, what, then the feature pack after this one, we're going to get one other tiny little improvement? It just seems like we're moving at a snail's pace, and that's my general vibe for a lot of the world versus world changes. So, uh, let's move on to those. That was the uh, first update, the uh, talks about the commander icons. There have actually been changes to World vs. World also. Um, the last really substantial change we saw to World vs. World, I guess, was the introduction of the Edge of the Mist, an entirely new map. However, for the core World vs. World players who only care about fighting for their server and so forth, Edge of the Mist does not have a strong enough connection to the rest of the game type for people to care. It's just become a place where people go and train, and so not much really changed there. The biggest update before that was probably Borderlands Bloodlust or the introduction of World vs. World leveling and ranks, but these were all a long time ago, so what is changing this feature pack for World vs. World players? Very little. Okay, you get colored commander tags. What else? Well, let's have a look. They have announced before that um, they would update the things you can spend world versus world points on, they would extend some of these tracks so that they go as long as, say, the Defense Against Guards track currently does. None of that's changed. They have added one new mastery, and this is Golem Mastery. Uh, the buffs you can look forward to if you spend your 75 points in here is gaining super speed after destroying a wall or a gate. Uh, the ability to increase your Golem's offensive and defensive stats. A new AoE healing effect to your shield bubble skill and perhaps most excitingly gain access to the ejection seat which means if you die in your golem currently in world vs world that would kill you too but this will now kick you out that's actually something i feel should be in all areas of the game like the uh racial golem skill a surrogate it's so terrible anyway but just the idea of being able to eject from that and not instantly go defeated is something i feel like it should just have by default anyway you can now spec into that for the golems really out of everything i just told you the most interesting part is that they will have new offensive capabilities we'll be perhaps seeing golem rushes be even that more exciting that more effective but whether that's actually good for the world versus world game type or not i suppose depends entirely on your perspective as a world versus world player and whether you think that there needs to be more defense play and holding of locations or not but that's one thing the golem mastery that's it though for world versus world ranks uh, again i found myself a little underwhelmed i must be honest you remember a while ago they added a vendor who would sell traps and tricks Tricks actually have never been a thing. They've been like a tab as far as I'm aware, but there aren't any tricks in game. Well, the first trick is finally being added. This trick is very interesting and on its own, it may look like a small thing, but it actually will have very big ramifications to the way world versus world is played. Potentially for the positive, potentially not. It completely depends on its implementation and on how players end up using it. But the idea is this is a siege disabler grenade. So you buy it for Badges of Honor first of all, but then you do have to spend supply to activate it, just like with the supply traps we currently have, for example. Um, so this will still cost supply, so it still be, will be limited in its use. You will still have to invest as a server into using these things, um, and that's obviously going to take away resources for other things, um, which can be a big stretch during prime time hours. But the idea is once you've got it built, you can throw it at 1200 range. This is not therefore as far as, say, engineer grenades are. So if you're familiar with hazing walls and things as your engineer, it's not quite that far range. Where it lands, it will then pulse out in a radius of 450, however, and this is rather large. And any siege within that radius will be disabled for a duration of time, depending on the siege it is. So if it's a golem, I think they said it's 20 seconds it will be disabled. If it's uh, other more generic types of siege weapons, they will be disabled for 45 seconds. The idea here is that if you are, say, defending a place, if you're a scout in a tower, they do envision this as something that's supposed to help defenders 
rather than attackers. And you as a scout, say, in a tower, will be able to use a little bit of this excess supply to throw your grenade down, disable a bunch of enemy flame rams, catapults, golems, whatever you like, and hopefully your allies, your zerg, can come in and actually mop them up. The question here is, though, whether these grenades will be able to be used offensively. As far as I can see, you guys know I'm not the biggest world versus world art. I don't know that much. I've spent a fair amount of time this past week in world versus world trying to flip a damn garrison so that I can get my uh, crate kin. But I, as a player, I'm still not entirely sure what world versus world can benefit from most. Is more defense definitely what we need, it seems? Most people are kind of lukewarm to the idea of this grenade. Particularly, there's a big fear that attackers can use it to throw it on walls and disable the scout's ACs and counter trebs and whatever else people are using. And so the complete opposite effect will happen here and it's not going to incentivize defense in any way. I also, from what I can see in my attempts of like ninja flipping towers and things so that I can get my world completion, it seems that it doesn't even matter how much siege a server builds. Uh, the thing that causes locations to flip so much and defending to feel less viable in some ways is that you sort of need 24 hour coverage on locations from a scout. It doesn't matter how many of these grenades are in the game, it doesn't matter how many ACs you build on walls or what you put inside the location you're trying to defend, if no one's there to scout it, because you can set up a couple of guild catters or something and blow up a wall even at tier 3 so quickly, it means that you're going to lose that location regardless. And this means that defending is still going to be a sticky spot whether these grenades are in the game or not. Just my personal view of it, but I'm also seeing right now that for me in tier 1, there's a location right now, the garrison that I need to finish my legendary, hasn't flipped for 8 days. Over a week, two different servers have held the damn thing over these 8 days, and neither of them have let go of this garrison. That's actually a long time to be holding a, a location for. A long time for it to never have flipped. People never actually managed to get the whole thing. And so um, it's actually opened my eyes to the fact that there's quite a lot of defense going on already. It's literally a matter of scouts rather than Siege. Maybe wrong, probably wrong. I'm not actually that high rank in World vs. World, but we'll see how things are affected. Uh, and that's it. <laughs> Sadly, those are the only two changes for World vs. World. It's not substantial enough for me. I mean, the big exciting things that would really bring me back and seriously look at it as like a primary game type for me would be stuff like the Borderlands Bloodlust changes and physical changes to the maps and maybe even the way PPT works. Actual major changes to World vs. World. That's what I want to see. The uh, running around in small groups is kind of fun until you've been flattened by a Zergs millions of times and you feel like you can't accomplish anything. And running around in a Zerg, I find pretty boring. It's more of a commander's game. Honestly, the most interesting thing I find about World vs. World as a game type is the idea of siege placement. I watched a really interesting uh, video series someone put online about different locations you can put siege and counter siege and proxy siege and all the different stealth locations you can set things up to take objectives. That's the most interesting thing about World vs. World. And if anything, this update is just not nurturing that because you no longer need siege to destroy siege. You can just throw these grenades and chain them together and there you go. So I'm curious. I'm curious whether World vs. World is going to get some serious love soon. Um, I can totally understand anyone in that community that feels like they're be being neglected. Because it sort of looks like they are being neglected. The third and final article for Competitive Week detailed the fact that there's going to be a new World vs. World season. This is the World vs. World Fall Tournament. Uh, they're sticking with a Swiss style kind of thing, but they're making it much shorter, which should make it work better. Instead of being so long, it's only going to last for four weeks. I believe you will only have, ever have like one matchup against specific servers. Every single matchup, therefore, you have, you absolutely want to win. There's incredible incentive to come first and if not first, come second. So there'll be less kind of ganging up in theory less double teaming and also people won't get really sick and tired of it where they fatigue themselves over a matter of weeks and weeks and weeks. The reception to this seems to have been largely positive. Uh, another change though that's kind of worrying is the fact there's going to be no server lockouts. Now by server lockouts, if you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, this is the idea that previous season, if you wanted to swap in the middle of the season, you would have to wait for a long time. So I was on Emery Bay at the start of the previous season and shortly after it began, I transferred to Blackgate. When I did this, I wasn't allowed to compete in the current matchup or the next matchup either. I was locked out of World vs. World for two full weeks. And what this does is, though it may seem punishing, it forces people to actually have some dedication on their server. It stops people swinging around all the time just trying to bandwagon onto the server that they think is going to win the most. And it stops people uh, spying and trolling and uh, basically ruining things, tag watching. 
Um, but now they've removed this limit. Now, in theory, that kind of makes sense, right? It's a much shorter duration. Are you really going to lock people out for two weeks? Ha they miss half the tournament because they chose to transfer in the middle of it. On the one hand, I would say, look, it's really short, so people will need to make that decision early and just lock it out completely. But ArenaNet tried to be more free, and I think that's an honorable idea. Except I think there's been an oversight. Uh, anyone who has an alt account with no characters on that account can get a free transfer without any lockouts this season. And so what you will find happening, especially in the higher tier matchups, is people will spy on other servers by using alt accounts with no characters and just transfer at will wherever they like. And this has always been something that's caused a lot of hostility within the World vs. World community. And if ArenaNet don't address that, it might really cripple how this tournament feels in general. That's just my understanding of it again. I'm kind of talking about stuff I'm not a total expert on here, so please bear with me if something's slightly off. But it, it does look worrying from what I've seen. The rewards in this tournament have changed slightly also since it's so much shorter. I expect the achievements to be a lot easier. Arena Nets seem to just be making them easier and easier and easier. But the difference here is you're rewarded on a week by week basis. So to qualify for the rewards of the first week, you actually have to go in and get an achievement showing that you've spent some time in World vs. World that week prior. And this I actually think is a positive thing. It means that you won't have people logging in in day one of the tournament just to zerg around and get their meta complete and then never return. People are going to have to maintain some kind of vested interest in World vs. World to get their tickets from this tournament and that's good. It means that the population should be fairly steady the entire way through the tournament, especially considering it's a lot smaller. The other result of this is that there are a lot more tickets up for grabs this time and that means if if you do well, you can get a lot more Misforge heroes, weapons, and so forth. They are finally, and this is possibly the best update of them all, guys. They are adding a Doliac statue to the Citadels. There you go. And you can interact with this thing. It will actually give you a buff to your world, world versus world XP gain. And the duration of this buff will change based on how good your server is at world versus world. So a bit more incentive to hopefully feel that patriotism and try and make your server do very good. Anyway, there you go, guys. That's pretty much everything that was announcing competitive week very mellow really quite shallow especially for pve players i really am looking forward to what they announced this week fresh start and i'll keep you guys in the loop as that stuff comes out one tiny little extra thing also uh, news wise is today is the uh two-year anniversary of guild wars 2 for head start players technically they consider the anniversary be to be on the 28th not head start people but um so many of us have started getting our second birthday gifts there is a very interesting item you can get you might want to log in and check this thing out if you're two years old you get a gun a, a little toy which when you double click you can fire consumables out on the floor like uh engineer med packs basically and when allies of yours walk over these they gain a buff this buff will give them plus 40 to all their stats and a bunch of other nice things like 15% magic find, 10% karma gain, and I think 15% gold find as well. At first, I thought this stacked with your food and your utilities, and I just thought this was this amazing goddamn thing that everywhere you saw now, from now on, you'd have people resupplying one another with cake just because it gave you this extra stuff. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't stack with your food. It counts as food. So this means it will work with, say, a metabolic primer. The default duration is only 10 minutes, and with the primer, obviously, you can go a fair bit further. But it's a nice idea. There's some uh, weird quirks with it also. Like, for example, you as a ranger, you can shoot cake at your pet to give it plus 40 to all of its stats, and it will even get more magic find in theory too. Like, these are kind of fun ideas. Uh, I hear that the scaling as well, if you go into world versus world, we've been talking about it a lot this video, if you go into world versus world on the level 1 and then get some cake from someone else, it buffs your stats like mad, like the defense against guards does and stuff, for some uh, kind of peculiar and fun things. But, um, that's the main thing this year. This is the uh, not technically the first year, but one of the only years ever in the Guild Wars franchise's history of not giving us minis for a birthday celebration. Uh, that saddens me, but it was something I realized was coming pretty much when the game launched and they stopped minis from being a yearly feature and just turned it into a cash cow, which is something from the gem store, right? So, uh, yeah, it feels kind of weird, but hey, I didn't need any more mini Jenners as it was. And uh, we've got what we've got. I like the cake gun. There may even have been footage on this video of me stood around firing cake at key farmers for tips. Anyway, there you go, guys. That's news for today. I'm going to burrow away and work on a bunch of other stuff. Hope you guys enjoyed. Let me know what you think about the World vs. World stuff. I have to say, overall, I'm underwhelmed. Even as a player who doesn't do that much World vs. World, I am a little underwhelmed. Uh, but let me know what you think, guys. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you next time.